Recently, everyone has been talking about the Third Temple. But what do the Jewish people think about it? At the beginning of this video, I will share with you some interviews with the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And then, we'll talk more about the Third Temple, the Temple Institute, and how close are we to the building of the Third Temple. But before we will do that, remember to subscribe to the Israel My Channel, give a like to this episode, and leave a comment. With that out of the way, let's start our episode. Have you heard about the Temple Institute and uh, do you know that they're planning to build a third temple? I never heard of this. Okay. No. Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? I think it's a <laughs> bad idea. Bad idea. Bad idea. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yes. On the Temple Mount. What do you think about it? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Excellent idea. Excellent idea. Yes, why not? Okay, <laughs> great. Do you think it should be like right now or it's, do you have to wait for a good moment? Um, I don't know right now, but mm -hmm. uh, the right moment uh, God will... Uh, of course. Yeah. So I don't know especially what time. Yeah. But uh, we do what we can to to make it uh, ready. ready faster, mm -hmm. ready. Super. Todaraba. Todaraba. Ready to. Uh, things getting ready to build the third temple. Do you think it's a good idea or, or a bad idea? What's your opinion on that? Um, I don't really have an opinion. I think it depends on the um, Jewish people if they have uh -huh. it. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the Torah opinion. All right. Yeah. Okay, okay that's great. It. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. So what do you think about the plans to build the third temple? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? The reality is that the plans to build and work that's being done may not be what God wants at this point. He'll do what God wants. But what it does is it shows our desire. And what our desire is, we need a temple, not because we he needs it, because we want to have a place that we can approach God and feel Him even more palpably. But in Jewish understanding, none of that happens till Isaiah 11 is fulfilled. And Isaiah 11 says, fulfilled says, when, the, when that time comes, the knowledge of God will cover the earth like water covers the ocean. Not the belief in God, the knowledge of God. That means if God wants a temple, not only I want to, go, want to build it, but so will Muhammad down the road, and so will President Biden, and so will the Prime Ministers of all the leaders of all the world, because it'll be the biggest coming together. It's a solution, not the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay for us to use it? Of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. Who is it for, though? Who is it? We have Israel, uh, Israel on my channel. Cool. You can Enjoy. check it out. Thank you very so much. much about the third temple is it a good idea to build it or a bad idea what do you, what's your opinion on that that's a good question <laughs> i think about it a lot um it's not really something i think about all the time okay. because yeah. it's just not feasible you know like what are we gonna do knock down the yeah the uh dome of the rock but mm -hmm. you know like a lot of rabbis talk about it yeah i like the vision of okay. of you know mashiach peace on earth mm -hmm. but the actual physical temple, I try not really to think about. All right, great. Is it okay for us to use it? On our yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and everything's getting ready to build a third temple. Do you have any opinion on it? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? To make a third temple? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a good well, idea, I guess. I, I, I think, like, according to, like, our Bible, I guess, yeah. it's, like, the third temple is going to come down from God. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, not supposed to be man-made, I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I guess like creating one would kind of go against it. Okay, got it. Understand it. Where are you from, guys? Uh, we're from Chicago. Oh, super great. great. Is it okay for us to use it? Go for it. on my channel. Check it out. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Bye. Bye. Okay. So the question is: Have you ever heard about the Temple Institute uh, and that they're planning to build the third temple? No. No? Okay, so you okay. don't have probably any opinion on it, right? I don't have any opinion. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much. Oh, have you ever heard about the Temple Institute and that they are planning to build the third temple? No. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, no. so yeah. no. No? No? You haven't heard? Okay. Ah, all right. Yeah, that's Thank it. Thank you. Have you ever heard about the Temple Institute? And no. No, you haven't? No. no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, have you heard about the Temple Institute? No. No. No, you didn't. Okay. You you didn't hear about the the institute that is planning to build the third temple? No. No. You didn't. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. So, as you can hear, there are different opinions among the Jewish people regarding the third temple. 
It is a controversial topic, and when I asked our question, some people preferred not to answer. But what is clear from this sample of opinions is that there is no one opinion on the third temple. Most of the people we asked were men, because in the old city of Jerusalem, most women were orthodox and did not like to be filmed. Perhaps next time I should survey some people in Tel Aviv. I'm sure that would be an exciting video. What do you think? But let's talk about the third temple. There is no doubt that the Temple Institute is preparing itself to build the third temple. Not only they are getting ready to build it, but also to build it in the location where today the Dome of the Rock stands. Of course, this creates a real problem because none of the Arab people would allow such construction. So, there are basically two options. It's going to be destroyed or it's going to fall apart. Now, the destruction of the dome would undoubtedly cause massive outrage among Muslims. And it must be noted that the Dome of the Rock is holy not only to the Palestinians but also to 1.8 billion followers of Islam. So, if Israel attempts to destroy the dome, then it's Israel against all Muslim people. In that scenario, we are basically looking at Armageddon. Of course, this is expected in Christian and Jewish apocalyptic literature. The prophets of the Old Testament and the writers of the New Testament mention a grand coalition against Israel. This mighty army will be determined to destroy Israel. Only the miraculous intervention of God will save Israel. In the book of Ezekiel, this battle is called the War of Gog and Magog, and in the book of Revelation, it's called Armageddon. The other option is that something will happen to the Dome of the Rock. And you know, it is not a new thing. For example, the Dome of the Rock totally collapsed in an earthquake in 1015 AD. The same thing happened to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which also was destroyed by an earthquake in 746 AD. And if you look closely at the foundations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you will notice that there are cracks in the wall. Another earthquake would undoubtedly cause the collapse of this structure. Nevertheless, the Temple Institute does its job and gathers information and resources to allow it to build the temple when the time is right. Once there is a green light to start the construction on the Temple Mount, it will take a little time to build it. The Institute has also made some groundbreaking discoveries that were necessary for the building of the temple. What are they? First of all, it seems that they have found a breed of cows that can produce perfect red heifers. It was a big news when on September 15, 2022, five red heifers arrived in Israel. The heifers are all under one year old and if they remain 100 red and avoid any blemishes which would disqualify them, they will each be eligible to be used to create the ashes required by the Jewish law to purify those who has been in contact with the dead body. Why are the red heifers important? What does a cow have to do with the rebuilding of the holy temple? How could a simple animal play a vital role in the success or failure of such monumental event? God's word states that only red heifers can restore the biblical purity needed to rebuild the temple. In Numbers 19.4, we read, Then Eliezer, the priest who is take some of its red heifer blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. Additionally, in Numbers 19.9, we read, A man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and put them in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. They are to be kept by the Israelite community for use in the water of cleansing, it is for purification from sin. According to the Temple Institute, those cleansing waters are necessary to ritually purify the Temple Mount area 
the sacred vessels and the entire Levitical priesthood that are all being prepared for service today. Those waters of sanctifications were also sprinkled unto all those who were impure, and many were first purified in this process before entering the courts of the temple. And although various methods may be employed to cleanse a person from other forms of defilement, such as real water immersion, the mikvahs, the ashes of the red heifer is the only remedy for the defilement that results from the contact with a corpse. What is interesting is that some Jewish sages believe the ordinance of the red heifer can be connected to the sin of the golden calf. And so, the red heifer is believed to serve in some way as atonement for the terrible consequences of the Israelites worshipping the golden calf when they were brought out of Egypt. In order for the cow to qualify as a red heifer for this holy purpose of purification, it must meet the following requirements as outlined in Numbers 19 and also in the writings of the oral tradition of the Talmud. So here are the rules. The red heifer must be absolutely perfect in its redness. Even two hairs of any other color would disqualify it. Even its hooves must be red. Number two, it was to be three or four years old, although older animals could be used, younger could not. Number three, it must be free of any kind of internal or external defect or blemish. And finally, it must not have been used for any type of physical labor and never have been placed under a yoke. Not even once. Only an animal that meets all those requirements may be used to provide the ashes of the purification process in fulfillment of the commandment. Another interesting thing is that the animal was not technically a sacrifice since it was not slaughtered and burned in the temple. Rather, it was slaughtered on the Mount of Olives outside the camp as it is written in Numbers 19.3. A special bridge was erected which led out from the eastern gate of the holy temple and connected with the Mount of Atonement, that is the spot on Mount of Olives, directly facing the gate and light with the entrance to the sanctuary where the purification process was conducted. This bridge was especially constructed of arches which overlapped one atop the other so that there would be hollow spaces under the path which the priest thread. In this manner, contact with the impurity was stopped as detailed in biblical law. It was by this same bridge that the scapegoat was taken out of the temple and into the desert on the Day of Atonement. The heifer, the officiating priest who will be burning it, and all these who will be assigning or assisting the ceremony made their way over this bridge to the appointed location on the Mount of Olives. A singular altar is erected at this spot, the wood arranged on the altar is preferably made up of cedar, pine, cypress and fig. From these are generally free from knots and holes. The fire will be ignited from its western side, the end facing the temple. The wood is placed in the shape of a small tower, wide at the bottom and narrower toward the top. Small spaces are made in the pile to let the air circulate. The heifer is bound to the altar with cords made from reed grass, which do not become impure. It is placed on the top of the wood arrangement with its head on the south side and its face westward towards the temple. The Kohen stands on the eastern side also facing west. After the fire is finished and all has been completely burned, Everything there is ground down and pulverized, including the wood and all parts of the animal. The entire black mass is beaten with rods and shifted, and these are the ashes which will be saved and used for purity. 
Then a vessel is filled with running waters, which is water flowing from a natural source, like a spring. Some of the ashes are flung into the same vessel, and this mixture of ashes and water are sprinkled on the body of a man on his third day and seventh day after sunrise. It was also sprinkled on clothing or vessels that became impure by having been within the same tent or any enclosure that contained a body. The waters were administrated by one who was already pure. A hyssop was used to sprinkle the water onto the person or the vessel. So, as you can notice, this was a very important ceremony and it is necessary to have the red heifer to even begin the service in the temple. And so, the Temple Institute is getting near to finding the red cows that are critical for this ceremony. They also found a location on the Mount of Olives where such an altar could be erected. But that's not all. The Institute invested huge amounts of time to research the biblical dye making. In the book of Exodus, we learn of the beautiful fabric dyed sky blue and royal purple and crimson red. We learn that the Israelites, inspired by God with wisdom, understanding and knowledge, produced those colors. For a long time, it was difficult to recreate the crimson red dye. The dye is referred to in the Bible as Tola'at Shani. The term is usually translated as crimson wool, but the actual term refers to the insect, which is the source of the dye. The dye produces a unique shade of red used for the temple curtain as well as high priest garments. Now, the rabbinic authorities have finally confirmed that they have found the insect that can produce the crimson dye. In the rabbinic literature, the dye is referred as echorit, which was extracted from the body of the crimson worm. In Israel, this worm can be found on the branches of the oak, found in few specific areas of Israel and for approximately two weeks in the early spring. The females attach eggs, sacs to the tree and fill them with red eggs. The tree's eggs, sacs are difficult to discern due to their size and color. Collecting the insects is painstaking and produces a minuscule amount of the dye. So those are just two examples showing you how far we are in the research necessary for the building of the third temple. But additionally to those two spectacular discoveries, the finding of the red heifer and the red dye, the Temple Institute has produced large amount of vessels and tools needed for the temple. A good example of the work can be seen next to the Havra synagogue, where you can see a giant menorah that is waiting for the third temple. The Temple Institute also worked on the building plans for the third temple. And this is something I would like to comment on. From what I have seen through the art produced by the Temple Institute and their descriptions of the future temple, it looks like the new temple will be similar to the Herod or Solomon's temple. I mention this because in the Bible we have a description of the temple that was never built. The prophet Ezekiel provides us with a detailed description of the future temple. This temple is sometimes called the Millennial Temple or simply Ezekiel's Temple. Now, I made a whole episode about this spectacular structure and if you would want to learn more about this temple, check out my video. I will leave a link in the description for you to watch. You can also click on the thumbnail above to do it right now. But to summarize, first you had the tabernacle, the Mishkan, in the desert, perhaps on Mount Moriah or even the city of David before the temple was built. Then we had Solomon's temple, which got destroyed in 586 BC. Around 516 BC, another temple known as the Zerubbabel temple was built, 
the temple complex was expanded by the Hashmoneans and eventually greatly enlarged by Herod the Great. In AD 70, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. After years of neglection of the Temple Mount, in the 7th century Jerusalem is ruled by the Muslims who built on the Temple Mount the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Today, you can see those structures on the Temple Mount. The next stage is the Third Temple, which is being planned by the Temple Institute. But according to Biblical prophecy, there will also be a fourth temple. The Millennial Temple is described in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Before you go, please check out my Facebook and Instagram pages. I know that you may not like Facebook, but I do share some interesting art on those platforms and it will help you to stay connected. Also, if you think that my work is helpful, please consider supporting the channel. You can do that by going to the Israel My Channel main page and clicking join, or even better, you can click the patron page and become my patron. All support is greatly appreciated. I am really thankful to all the people who support the channel because that helps me to improve. Of course, don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. Lastly, let me know what you think about the episode in the comment section. Have a great day and Shalom. Mm -hmm.